Well, welcome to prayer meeting tonight. Our uh, devotional thoughts comes from Romans chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 13 to 25. And I call this lesson, Faith Alone. Faith Alone. And as we read our scripture, it'll really come to your mind, uh, the text that Paul is talking about, an example that he's using, and the importance of faith alone. Uh, verse 13, he says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect, because the law brings about wrath. For where there is no law, there is no transgression. In those short verses, Paul tells us that people see God in one of two ways. One way he calls the law. Now, obviously, in this text, he means the law of Moses. But modern people take a different slant on this law. They call it being a good person. Have you ever had somebody really you know, have confidence in himself because I'm a good person? Well, that's kind of the same thing here. The second and opposite way people see God is through the righteousness of faith. Now, this is not a phony righteousness of a merely professed religion. This is a real righteousness that can come only into a person's life through a genuine relationship with God. So an important question you need to answer is, do you have a genuine relationship with God or just a profession? If being a good person or just doing good things makes one right with God, then faith in God and accepting his righteousness is totally meaningless. Good people tend to define good things by the good things they do or by the things they don't do. Now, it's certainly right to do good things, isn't it? And this world would be a much better place if more people did good things. But this self-righteous attitude only serves to blind a person to everything that God requires of them. It's the same thing as saying, I really don't need God because I'm good enough. Or perhaps a less arrogant version of this is more like this. I do some good things, so I hope I will be right with God. Okay, a lot of people walking around, people you know, it's kind of the way they really feel about it. You know, I do some good things and I hope I'll be right with God. Well, this good person attitude voids faith and it blinds people to most of what God has revealed in his word. Such causes people to disregard what the Bible teaches. In reality, it is the same as putting oneself over Jesus because the attitude becomes this. I do not need to do what Jesus said or I do not have to avoid the things that Jesus said to avoid. So in reality, the attitude of being a good person as opposed to a person of faith is essentially the same sin as Adam and Eve committed in the Garden of Eden. Paul says that the end result of the law of being a good person brings about wrath. And why is this? Because it acknowledges no personal transgression and it does not, does not recognize sin for what it is. And not recognizing sin only, is only an open floodgate that allows sin in all its good ways to rule in a person's life. If your personal goodness can get you to heaven for eternity, then Jesus' death on the cross was totally useless. Why would God do something useless if you could make it to heaven in your own goodness? Paul wrote that the law brings about wrath. The commentator Barnes explains this for us. He wrote this, While a man is fallen and a sinner, 
its tendency so far from justifying him and producing peace is just the reverse. It condemns, denounces wrath, and produces suffering. So the idea of the good deeds law is totally wrong, totally misguided, and points a person in absolutely the wrong direction for eternity. And then looks at verses four, uh, 16 through 22. There's quite a few verses here, but Paul is using Abraham as an example, and he gets in as much of the necessary information uh, to that story to make his point. Verse 16, he says, Therefore it is a faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. According to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Specifically, Paul is bringing up uh, how that God promised to Abraham that he would have a son. Okay? And through that lineage, that there would be a great nation raised up uh, to, to Abraham. And uh, Abraham was about 100 years old. And even at this time, that was, that was an old man, okay? And physically, it just basically was not possible to have a, a child at that age because his wife, uh, Sarah, was about 90 years old. And her um, reproductive process had come to an end. So... Both of them, it's like their bodies were dead, but he didn't waver. He believed God in spite of the facts about his own body and his wife's body. So Bible says that God accounted that to Abraham for righteousness. Now, God's promise of salvation and eternal life comes only through faith and no other way like his promise to Abraham about having a son and about a nation being raised up to him. It comes only through faith. Salvation is an act of God's grace. Why? Well, the Bible clearly states that all people are sinners and alienated from God. So we are totally hopeless to help ourselves. No one can erase the fact of sin from his own life, no matter how much good he tries to do. Forgiveness and cleansing from sin can only happen through God's grace. And frankly, we do not deserve it. But God will do this for us. Why? Because he loves us. God so what? Loved whom? the world, not just a few people, not just those that are Christians, but you realize that everyone on planet Earth that's alive today, everyone that lives in Lawton, Oklahoma, God loves those people. He knows everyone individually and loves them. Now, Paul writes at length about the example of Abraham and how God gave him a promise in which he believed and trusted, even though he did not see that promise fulfilled in his lifetime. Yes, he did have a son, 
but he never saw this great nation raised up. He died long before that happened. Abraham did not give up on God. He was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And God did fulfill this promise centuries after Abraham died. But God did honor his promise just as Abraham knew he would. As for a person of the do-good law, one might feel that God can't or won't do what the Bible promises God can do in his life. But the truth is, God can and God will. He can cause you to become born again and filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can fellowship him in reality and live the life that he intends for you to live. Faith is more powerful than the do-good law. The do-good law is phony, but faith gives access to grace. And grace, my friend, is very real. Now, you have to get your mind off the law of do good and trust in the promise of God that the atonement through Jesus will work in your life. This, my friends, is faith. And this will allow God to work his miracle of salvation in your life. Let's look at verse 23 through 25. Paul says, now it was not written for his sake alone, meaning Abraham's, that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So Paul does bring up the atonement here. He says, Jesus was delivered up because of our offenses. In other words, Jesus died for the sins you committed. I committed. All people have committed. And friend, your deeds, your good deeds, cannot atone for the sins you have committed. God's plan for salvation required Jesus to die for your sins. And you have to accept what he did for you. Or you will take your good deeds along with your sins into eternity. And those good deeds will do nothing but haunt you with deep guilt for all eternity. Those deeds, in fact, will only cause you eternal sorrow. And those good deeds will be the flames of hell that you cannot escape. But God's grace does not stop just with just Jesus' death for sin. Paul says, he was raised because of our justification. Maybe that's not quite clear. The Living Bible puts it this way. He rose again to make us right with God, filling us with God's goodness. I can understand that. Can you understand that? He rose again, why? To make us right with God, filling us with God's goodness. Accepting the atonement by faith allows God to justify your life, making you right with God and filling you with God's goodness, not your goodness. Christ's blood totally obliterates the record of your sins and allows God to give you a new life. And certainly, your new life will be filled with good works, but not your good works. Your life as one of the redeemed is to reflect the life of Jesus. You see, God wants you to be a modern Abraham, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And friends, this can happen only by faith. Amen.